So in this video, I get to talk about one of my favorite topics in biomechanics, which is running. I've talked a lot about walking gait in my previous videos, or if you've taken my undergrad or graduate courses, locomotion is one of the most fundamental human movements that we can biomechanically analyze. So it's a natural progression to shift from walking gait over to the running gait. And you'll find that the kinematic, kinetic, and energetic patterns that we see in the lower body during running is very similar to what we see during walking, but obviously, obviously there are some exaggerated deviations, and we're going to talk about that in the next few minutes here. So we've got here a runner that's on, on a treadmill, and we can view the runner from both the sagittal view as well as the frontal view and the posterior side. Uh, we can discuss the different aspects of uh, pelvic movement, uh, hip kinematics, knee kinematics, as well as the ankle, and describe the differences that we see during running as compared uh, to walking. And the obvious difference that we see during running is, um, is increased velocity, increased ground reaction force during the stance phase, and of course the double float phase. That's the major difference that we see between running and walking is that the person is literally off the ground and there are two um, periods during the running gait cycle in which we see that double float phase. It's called double simply because both legs are off the ground. Uh, as a result, there is no double stance phase the way that we see in walking, right? In walking, we see an initial and second double support phase. The stance phase is decreased down to roughly 40% of the gait cycle, whereas during walking, we see that at 60%. There's increased uh, swing phase, and there's an overlap in swing phase between the left and right side. So this is the running gait cycle. This is one stride from a foot strike, uh, let's just say it's the right side, to foot strike again of the same side at 100%. So as I mentioned, stance phase is 40% of the gait cycle. That's when the, uh, the right toe in this example with toe off, it goes into the, the first double float phase right here. That's roughly 15% or the period in time in which that occurs is 15%. So both legs are obviously off the ground and then the contralateral leg contacts the ground and the right side in this case is swinging forward and then as it approaches its terminal swing the contralateral leg goes into its respective swing phase so that's why they have that overlapping swing phase here so to kind of give you an idea uh, on the difference in the stride or the gait cycles between walking and running i've got here the gait cycle for walking here on the top and the gait cycle for running here on the bottom. So you, you like I said, if you viewed in my videos on gait, on the gait cycle, on walking gait cycle, a lot of these events and uh, phases should be familiar to you. So stance phase, 60%. That's when toe off occurs. Swing phase is 40%. Uh, initial double support represents the loading response here. Then the mid stance, terminal stance, and of course toe off into the swing phase. Now let's take a look here at the stride for uh, running. Stance phase, as I mentioned earlier, occurs right around 40%. You see the double float phase here when both legs are off the ground, uh, goes into its initial swing and then terminal swing, and then that overlaps with the contralateral side going in, in, into its respective swing phase. During the stance phase, it's pretty straightforward. The first half of the stance phase is absorption. That's power absorption. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the energetic aspects of running. So the first part is, is shock absorption. This is the person, the runner is now landing and on the ground, and so, he or she will be eccentrically firing the muscles in order to absorb that shock, right? The initial shock from landing on the ground to, to minimize what's called the impact force. And then that transition over to the propulsion phase of the stance phase in which the person now pushing off, towing off into the uh, swing phase or specifically the double float phase here. So here, stance phase and swing phase for walking for the walking gait cycle, and this is the running gait cycle as I mentioned earlier. The initial contact, uh, say the right side to initial contact on the same side, zero to one hundred percent, and the phases, stance and swing phases, are represented here along with the sandwich or the swing phase is sandwiched between the early and late float phases when both legs are off the ground. And so you, again, a number of these events are very similar to what we see during walking, but it's a lot more exaggerated. Major difference is the, <coughs> excuse me, the double float phases. 
So what we see from a kinematic and temporal aspect is that during running there are increased range of motion at the hip, knee, and ankle joints. The muscles around these joints uh, typically have greater eccentric contraction, right? That's muscular contraction uh, while it's lengthening. Uh, initial contact of fist strike will vary depending on speed, as I'll show you here in a sec. Uh, the center of gravity, the vertical displacement of the center of gravity, decreases with increased speed. And because the runner is always on one leg at a time, there's a decreased uh, base of support. So if again, if you're familiar with joint kinematics, um, during walking, you will see that these patterns are very similar um, what we see here, this is running, are very similar to what we see during walking. So, for example, hip flexion extension. Um, the only difference is, is the increased range of motion, increase of dynamic range of motion. Hip adduction. This is very important because now, as I mentioned, the runner is always on one leg at a time. So, the runner has to maintain that um, kind of the center of gravity and the frontal point closer to that base of support on the one leg. So obviously they're firing their hip abductors, right? Their gluteus medius lymph, um, gluteus medius uh, muscles, as well as their tensor fascia lata in order to maintain that, that nice centered position in the frontal plane. Uh, looking at knee flexion, you can see the uh, loading response, that initial absorption, that's the increased flexion during the stance phase here as it goes from absorption to uh, propulsion phase uh, periods during the stance phase. And then during the swing phase here, you have increased uh, knee flexion in order to swing the toe forward. At the ankle, uh, depending again on the running speed, what we observe initially is dorsiflexion in the early part of stance phase. And as the person begins to toe off or push off, you can obviously see the plantar flex position of the ankle and then back to dorsiflexion in the uh, late swing as the person prepares for uh, initial heel strike. In terms of ground reaction forces, I mentioned earlier that there are impact forces involved with running because the person is literally landing from a double flow phase, so something has to make do. So what we observe over um, many, many research studies that involve force platforms is that the impact force, the impact force is that initial contact force that's associated with all the segmental mass and acceleration as the person contacts the ground and the magnitude of that impact force has been reported to be somewhere between three to four times the person's body weight. That initial impact force is all otherwise known as a heel strike transient. It's passive. It's not anything that the runner does in terms of a muscular contraction. That's just, you know, momentum. That sudden change in momentum in a, a very small uh, window, right? A small duration. We're talking here a few milliseconds here. That's why is that that impact. It's just landing on, it's like landing from a jump. Very similar to that. And so that initial uh, part of that stance phase, as I mentioned earlier, is that deceleration, that eccentric contraction that would allow uh, some absorption of the initial impact shock. And then the second half, again, is generation. The person is now propelling into the swing phase. Uh, so the running force, the ground reaction force during running, obviously is analyzed only during the stance phase. And one of the key differences that we see during uh, running as compared to walking is that in walking you don't see that butterfly, uh, that that little uh, uh, double bump that you see in the vertical ground reaction force. You kind of see it here, but this is that heel strike transit I was talking about. This is that impact force that happens in the first few milliseconds when the person contacts the ground. Now, assuming this person or this runner is a heel to toe type of runner, this is the type of ground reaction, vertical ground reaction force that we see during running. Now, many years ago, I did some um, biomechanical study, I did a biomechanical study on cushioning shoes, the effect of cushioning shoes on um, ground reaction force, impact forces here. And the three metrics that we looked at was the impact force, which is the magnitude of that heel strike transient force here, which is denoted here by FZ1, the loading rate or the rate at which that impact force occurred over time as well as the propulsive force. This is the force associated with the person or the runner beginning to toe off into the swing phase. Uh, so here, um, 
in a separate video I talk about footwear biomechanics that running shoes are designed to do a number of three main things. They need to cushion, um, stabilize or or uh, control the, the rear foot motion and do so in, in an efficient manner. The cushioning part is what's known as impact attenuation. Is how well does the shoe on its own be able to attenuate this initial impact, that initial heel strike transient. The second mechanism by which a runner can minimize that load or attenuate that impact is what they do from a kinematic perspective, what they do at the ankle, what they do at the knee and hip. So I talk a little bit about that here later in this uh, uh, video. So subsequently, and once we have ground reaction for it, we've got the kinematics, we can then calculate the joint moments or torques about the hip, knee, and ankle. Again, looks very similar to walking. These uh, graphs here is taken by uh, Tom Novacek's uh, review on the biomechanics of running. If you've taken my graduate as well as my undergrad biomechanics class, I give a copy of this PDF. So it's a very informative. It gives you a nice introduction into the kinematics and kinetics and energetics of, of walking here. So let's concentrate on the knee. So this is the knee moments, and keep in mind these are internal moments or internal torque, and you can see what's happening initially during the gait cycle. So this is a stance phase. The solid line here represents running. The dotted line, the this one right here, represents I believe the long is is, is sprinting. Sorry, and then of course this dotted line represents um, walking. So very similar, but obviously the magnitudes. Are different in terms of the knee extension moment that occurs during the stance phase. So think about what that runner is doing during the stance phase. Remember it's going from absorption to propulsion. So that initial uh, part of the stance phase is all shock absorption, it's all propulsion. So uh, a key kinematic and kinetic mechanisms by which that occurs is to that eccentric contraction of your quadriceps. Quadriceps are what? Knee extensors. So when they contract, they create a knee extensor moment um, that would allow in the first half of the stance phase for the knee to flex eccentrically, right? To control that knee flexion. That's a shock absorption, followed by the concentric contraction of those same muscles in order to propel the person forward, the, the runner forward. Uh, so that's the, the knee moment. Uh, at the ankle joint, you can see here that the internal joint, or I'm sorry, internal moment at that joint is in a plat plantar flexor moment. What is a person trying to do from the go as they transition from the absorption to propulsion part of the stance phase? They're trying to toe off, trying to push off. So that's that plantar flexion torque created by the gastroc soleus and posterior tibialis muscles as they contract into the late stance there. Now, joint power here, uh, I have here three uh, joints, hip, knee, and ankle, and I have the joint power for those specific joints in the sagittal plane. Power is the rate of energy flow over time. We measure that in watts. And the way that we can calculate power is by taking the product of the joint torque as well as its angular velocity. So when the torque and angle velocity are moving in the same direction, we call that positive um, power. And that indicates when that joint is generating power. So that is an indicator of concentric contraction. When the torque and angle velocity are moving in the opposite direction, like for example, controlled knee flexion, knee extensors, those quadriceps eccentrically contract in order to slow down knee flexion, even though the knee joint is flexing during that early part of the stance phase, we call that absorption. So that is shock absorption. So the energy flow that's going through these respective joints can move from generation to absorption and vice versa, depending on where they're at during the stance phase. And so through some basic me uh, mechanics, um, some like equations such as I showed you here. We can use the kinematics and kinetics and ground reaction force that I showed you here in order to calculate uh, joint power and, and joint uh, work, mechanical energy. Why is that important? Because it helps us to understand the efficiency of running. So kind of give you an idea, even if you've never looked 
you know talked about power and don't know about power or energy you know that um, it takes a lot more energy to run a mile or two miles than it does to walk a mile right everyone could walk a mile or two because walking is very efficient in fact walking and I mentioned this in a separate video is, is modeled much like an inverted pendulum where there is a nice exchange between potential energy and kinetic energy potential energy is just energy due to um, position right or in this case height whereas kinetic energy is energy due to movement and so during walking it's often modeled as an inverted pendulum the pendulum shifts from potential to kinetic energy and so walking we see this so you know person doesn't have to use a lot of metabolic energy in order to walk at a preferred strike frequency whereas running on the other hand running the potential and energy waveforms are actually in phase so there is no exchange if you will so a lot of the cost that's due to running has to do with the runner being uh, able to contract the muscles in order to sustain the efficiency of running right so this is by the tendons by the joints themselves and the muscles more specifically the biarticular muscles so and unlike walking walking as i mentioned is modeled much like an inverted pendulum running is modeled with what's called a spring mass model here and if you can envision the body the human body as the the the, the head the arms and the trunk what we call the hat as the passenger and the locomotor system is the lower body here the legs act as a spring and the mass or point mass is um, is basically the head arms and trunk and so all that mass has been suspended or being uh, supported by this spring here which uh, represented here by your legs and then during the running gait cycle that spring um, compresses and then it releases what we call an elastic coil into the the um, the swing phase here. And one of the ways that we can measure the effectiveness of that spring of that spring mass model is what's known as leg stiffness. And leg stiffness is the ratio of vertical force and what's called deformation, the change in the length here. So if it takes more force in order to deform or change that length that system or those limbs are ten are are quote unquote stiffer if it takes less force then they're, they're they're less stiff right or if it deforms at a larger to a larger degree then the stiffness uh, obviously goes down so there are a number of different ways there are um, a, a number of research studies that use leg stiffness in order to measure the performance and injury risk of runners or the effectiveness of training interventions or running shoes but the biomechanical model most uh, used to illustrate what's happening here um, in terms of the energetics you're running is what's known as spring mass model. So spring here, your legs, and that's measured with leg stiffness. Mass, again, is the passenger, your head, arms, and trunk. So uh, you might have seen this. You've taken exercise physiology. This represents the energy costs of locomotion for both walking and running this u shape here is is what's known as the the energy cost of during walking and that is dependent on walking speed so there is a preferred walking speed in which a an individual is most efficient in walking be able to get that nice uh, exchange between potential and kinetic energy and as a person speeds up use up more energy if this person slows down you ever try walking slowly on a track um, it actually takes up more energy than it was than it would if you were to walk at your preferred stride frequency running on the other hand there, we really don't see that that time dependent or velocity dependent um, function in terms of the energy cost during running um, what we believe is happening is that because of that spring mass model you get that elastic recoil and there there's an optimized point in which that recoil occurs where the leg stiffness can't be too high or too low in addition to that there's also contact time optimized contact time so if this is a runner on a treadmill 
the legs here, as I mentioned, act as the spring. That spring compresses in the early part of the stance phase and then uh, releases, if you will, that elastic recoil during the propulsive phase, in addition to uh, what your muscles do from an active perspective. You might have heard of the stretch shortening cycle. We talk about that SSC phenomenon, um, specifically during jumping. Well, that can also be used to explain what we're viewing here in the spring mass model uh, during running. Um, from an ideal perspective, we would like to see a nice uh, exchange between that spring absorbing energy and then releasing all this energy um, during the propulsive phase. But in reality, that very rarely happens. It depends on what the runner does uh, and also what the, the speed is at which that runner is um, moving. Now, one of the ways a runner can be more economical or, or efficient in terms of their mechanics is by this exchange of uh, kinetic energy from one segment to the next. So this is a graph that was uh, published in Tom Novacek's Systematic Review on the Biomechanics of Running. And what he wanted to illustrate here is the role that muscles, specifically the biarticular muscles, play in uh, having these joints move in an economical um, uh, pattern here. And what we believe is occurring is that while a segment, let's just take the femur for example, is moving into an extended position into the latter half of the stance phase. Remember this is a uh, propulsion. So this is triple extension uh, at the hip, knee, and ankle. The femur is moving in this direction. The rectus acts as a conduit. It acts as a, a, an energy strap uh, through which mechanical energy that's being absorbed at the hip can be transferred over to the knee joint. So this is the later half of the stance phase. This solid line represents the uh, power generated at the knee, while this dotted line represents the power absorbed at the hip. And that energy exchange, that energy transferred, is manifested by that rectus femoris, that biarticular muscle that controls uh, knee extension as well as hip flexion. So that is one of the ways that a runner at least on the, on the joint level, can be more efficient or more economical in terms of their movement. Um, so looking at the hip, and specifically look at the hip extensor, the role that the gluteus maximus and the gluteus minimus and the hamstrings play in terms of propulsion um, increases as you go, as you uh, go from walking to running into sprint because of running speed. So as running speed increases, the contributions of the hip extensor subsequently increase. It goes from 7% to 14% to 24%. So you think of someone who is sprinting, the hip extensors, the, the glutes and the hamstrings play a larger role in making sure that the person can propel at a faster rate.